when a family's boat smashes onto a reef in the remote South Pacific Ocean. The sailing trip of a lifetime turns into a living hell. I feel like I'm in a scene from Titanic. Seriously injured and hopelessly trapped, a father can only watch as his wife and children battle for their lives. They were going to die one by one after me, and there was absolutely nothing I could do to stop it. Now, the fate of an entire family lies in the hands of their 16-year-old son. Sorry, Dad. The Silverwood family, from San Diego, California, is on a round-the-world sailing trip. Hey, Amelia, honey, will you come here and grab this? Which, which, uh... For Dad, John, the voyage is the fulfillment of a lifelong dream. John had always talked to me about going and doing the sailing thing. You know, he said, oh, let's, do, let's just go buy this boat and go, you know, put the kids on board and go sailing around the, the world. There's a lot of different reasons why we went on this voyage. Probably most important to me was that my kids experienced firsthand at a young and an impressionable enough age just the, the, the absolute freedom of being out on the ocean. Hey, Ben, you want to give your mom a hand? Yeah. Well, I think that's going to be OK. The family has already sailed 20,000 miles. You all set? They're now on the last leg of their journey, leaving the South Pacific island of Raiatea and heading for Australia three and a half thousand miles away. Australia, we were going to sell the boat and go back home and put the kids back to school and go back to work. OK, guys, come on, let's go. The family has spent the last 21 months on John's pride and joy. An 80-foot catamaran, the Emerald Jane, bought from his 20 years of hard work in the construction industry. Emerald Jane, she was just incredible. A great combination, you know, beauty, power, seaworthiness, strength. Her mast, 80 feet tall. I loved every inch of her. For John's three youngest children, Camille and Amelia, and their brother, Jack. The trip has been an unforgettable experience. The Emerald Jane has become their family home, as well as their very own school at sea. We had all the accoutrements of life that we would need, including probably 300 pounds of school books. <laughs> but not everyone on board has enjoyed the trip. Ben. What? You want to come over here and take over? I have to. John's teenage son, Ben, has found it hard going. I wanted to go home really badly because I just missed all my friends. And I was still in contact with a lot of my friends via email. So I tell them, tell them about stuff, and uh, I really missed them. Six months ago, Ben discovered that his dad had extended their trip. When I found out about that, I was pretty angry. I uh, kicked down the door, punched a little hole in the wall, and uh, basically threw a pretty sizable fit. But today, any grumbles have been left behind. They're out on the ocean and heading home. Amelia and, and Camille are both playing out on the deck. Jean's busy reading a book. They're at sea, and maybe a little bit grudgingly, but they're happy. Hello. So 
Everybody hungry? The Silverwood family while away a lazy afternoon at sea. There's a clanking sound up at the mast. Something that had never happened to us before. Can you see anything? Shackle. Where? It's loose. And the boom was now smashing into the mast repeatedly. And we wrestle with that problem for probably two hours. But John and Ben can't fix the sail. Yeah, I think we need it for the night, Ben. Really? I say, look, we'll fix this thing in daylight. Watch this side. We have to drop the mainsail down. And we continue on like that. As dusk falls, John sets the boat's navigation system to avoid one of the many tiny islands that dot the Pacific Ocean. And the Emerald Jane heads into the sunset. It's glorious. It's glorious. I'm just like at one with the universe. Below deck, the family relaxes, while Ben keeps watch in the cockpit. One more minute, and that's it, okay? John takes a rest, and the three younger children get ready for their evening meal. It's another night at sea, just like the hundreds they've spent together during their voyage. I start to hear this scraping sound. very light and I just think in my head well it's maybe it's a floating coconut palm or something we've just hit go back to your picture honey it's very there's this sharp bang sound then it starts to get louder and louder I run into the salon. Like chalk on a board on steroids, man. It's just ripping our ears apart. And my son's voice coming from the cockpit. One word. Reef! Reef! He's screaming, Reef. We looked at each other in horror. And in that same second, I hear this big boom. I just got thrown a good five, ten feet. The Emerald Jane has smashed into a submerged coral reef. John slams the boat's engines into reverse. The boat grinds to a halt on the reef. But their ordeal has only just begun. this giant wave hits the boat. The ocean has punched its way through the hull of the boat. The water just comes shooting through, exploding. I feel like I'm in a scene from Titanic. I just looked at John's eyes and you can tell he's scared. He's really, really frightened. He doesn't know what to do and I don't know what to do. The whole dream of my life was all disintegrating right in front of my eyes. And they're screaming, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. In just a matter of seconds, the Silverwood's idyllic sailing trip 
has turned into a living hell. The Emerald Jane is being ground into a reef in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and is being battered by violent waves. 
He's got blood coming down both sides of his face, and he's looking down at me. And I pull myself up, and doing a sit-up. I'm confronted with these two white bones, the remains of my lower leg, and they're shattered. You see the bone sticking out like toothpicks almost out of the side. The mast has almost completely severed John's leg below the knee. And beneath that, there's just this pool of blood that's spreading on the deck. Ben tries to free his father from under the two and a half thousand pound mast. This thing is 80 feet long. It's impossible. And I couldn't, like, just pull it out. He's losing huge amounts of blood from his shattered leg. And Ben knows that unless he can find a way to stem the flow, his dad has only minutes to live. He's in a huge bout of trouble. I said, Ben, my leg's broken. I'm trapped. You're in charge of the boat now. You've got to take care of the family. I watched his eyes. I could watch his expression and how it changed. Becoming a man. I could see that come over his face. And he just looks at me and he says, Dad. Dad, I'm going to get you out of here. I really didn't think about what the actual burden was on me or the responsibility. My reaction was just to keep doing stuff. Ben knows his dad is losing massive amounts of blood, and he has no time to spare. He has to stem the flow, or his dad will die. Within minutes, there's my son. It's gonna hurt. And he's got an idea. He takes that line and he wraps it around my thigh. Oh! And he's got these big screwdrivers. I wrapped it around as many times as I possibly could and then linked it together. Ben's tourniquet cuts the circulation to his dad's leg. Without that effort, I probably would have died within 10 minutes. Below deck. The cabin is flooding fast. Jean has to get the kids out and leads them up into the cockpit. Now the only safe haven on the boat. It's only now that she sees for the first time her husband's terrible condition. He's in horrible, horrible pain. Oh! I said, I'm going to go down below and get the first aid kit. Yes! Oh, no! The medical kit could help save his father's life. But Ben knows that if he lets his mum go below deck, she'll be walking into a death trap. She was kind of just pleading with me. She could go get the medicine. It'll only be a second. She knows exactly where it is. I told her it's just stupid to go down there. Do you get, if not killed, hurt really badly. My mom's 5'5", five five, I'm 6'1", so I was able just to hold her back. As he was forcing me to stay there, this massive, massive wave came over the boat. Blood 
blew out the, the front windows that surrounded the main salon where I was going. I would have been killed instantly if I was there. So he saved my life. With John pinned down beneath the immovable mast, the Silverwood family can do nothing but hunker down and pray for the waves to subside. But there's just no let up. I just remember those waves, were just the sound of those waves. You could just hear the roar get bigger and bigger. And closer and closer. Until finally, the wave would strike. John has now been trapped under the mast for two excruciating hours. The night just continued to drag on. It seemed like an eternity. I'm fighting with all I've got against this pain. The temperature is plummeting and he's battling the onset of hypothermia. I'm shaking, I'm shivering. My teeth are beginning to chatter uncontrollably. He's hemorrhaged more than 50% of his blood and can withstand little more. I recognize that my ability to act, to do anything to save myself, were slipping from my grasp. I was solely focused on causing my body to make the sound of my own breathing and causing my body to make the sound of my heart beating. And mentally, I'm one with my heartbeat. But there's this sensation that's just growing larger and larger and larger. Like a shot, I realize what it is. I'm going to die. I'm stuck underneath here. I'm bleeding to death. And I have to accept that. This torment, it just didn't seem like it was going to have any end. The pain is indescribable. John can withstand little more. And Ben and Jean make one last desperate attempt to free him from under the mast. That mass weighs over 2,500 pounds. I was pulling with all my might. In my son's mind, certainly, he knew it was impossible, but they just had to try. The mast is just too heavy to lift. It's impossible. There's just no escape. Out of that whole horrible abyss that I was lost in, there just came this single word, and that word was no. I wasn't going to quit. I was going to fight. I was not going to give up. Out of nowhere, a huge wave slams into Emerald Jane. They 
can see the mast, it's being lifted higher than ever before. In that same second, I pushed as hard as I could. And then the mast slapped back down on the deck and I was free. But three hours under the mast have left John in a terrible condition. I made my stomach turn just to see his leg just hanging by, I mean, literally a piece of skin. I fell into a, 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 an abyss of despair, like a free fall. I knew that I'd taken my wife and my kids out to this godforsaken reef. This whole thing was my idea. after I passed, they were going to die one by one after me, and there was absolutely nothing I could do to stop it. It was beyond horror. <sighs> we enter a phase there. It's just pure survival. You just have to hold on, and you have to survive. We just prayed. We didn't know what to do. The emergency beacon has been transmitting for over five hours. But they have no idea whether their call for help is being heard. Then, just after midnight. Mom! Mom, did you see that? We looked out off the stern of the boat and we started seeing this light. See that? Ah, get the flare gun. The light starts getting bigger and bigger. We thought, oh, wow, we're, it's a ship. We're going to get rescued. And I took the last flare we had, and I shot it up in the, the sky. And then all of a sudden, we realized it's not a ship coming. It's actually the moon that's coming up. And it was such a great disappointment for us because, you know, when you think you're going to be rescued and actually now you're still in the same position you were in, what are we going to do next? As the night wears on, the family cling to the wreckage of the boat as the waves relentlessly batter them. The boat was breaking up. The waves were just breaking with such intensity. Every time I would look, there would be a new part of the boat that would, would not be there. That was a terrifying part, because once the wave struck, you didn't know exactly what was going to happen to the boat next. Ben is the only guy on the boat that understands that since we had 60% of the boat, and now we've got 50% of the boat, pretty soon we're going to have 40%. And everybody on board the boat is going to die if they don't abandon ship. Ben knows the only possible way of getting his family off the boat is in the life raft, but nothing is safe from the endless waves. The life raft fell over and flipped over. The life raft is trapped in a tangle of wreckage. The family of six is now stranded on a sinking boat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, with no means of escape. 
In the moment that you think it can't get any worse, it can't get any bigger, it can't get any darker, it does. just breaking up so badly. We were pretty much in the last usable, safe spot of that boat. That's when I realized there was no way we could stay there. The risk was just too great. I decided that we had to leave the boat. Seven hours after they crashed, the tide around them begins to ebb, exposing a tiny outcrop of rock about 100 feet away. It's a possible escape route. But his dad is so badly injured, even the smallest journey is impossible. I know that, that there is no way to get me off of the boat to the reef alive. I wouldn't, I would not survive that trip. It's down to you now, son. It's a terrible decision for a 16-year-old to make but Ben knows he has no option. He must leave his dying father behind on the sinking boat in order to save the rest of his family. Ben is on his knees and he's crying, asking me to forgive him. because he sees a parting of the ways between myself and him. Sorry, Dad. When well, you're basically telling him goodbye, it was pretty tough to tell him that You don't ever really think your dad's going to die. 12 hours ago, he was dad, you know, just running around doing stuff on the boat. So it was very, it was very difficult. I understand completely what's going on. I was not concerned about myself. If there was no way to get me in, well, that was that. Now, as head of the family, Ben is faced with getting the three young children off the boat and across the reef to the tiny outcrop of dry rock. As soon as the wave broke and started to recede, that's why I jumped off the boat. The reef is so sharp, the little coral spikes would go right through my sandals. I had coral cutting my feet every time I took a step. They're cutting up their legs every which way. We have the waves breaking on our legs, and our legs are getting absolutely cut up. At that point, I gave my brother the little emergency beacon. Hold this, keep tight, yeah. I told him, Jack, do not let go of this. This is our only way anyone can possibly find us.
you've got to get off the boat now, too. You've got to get off the boat. Alone on the boat, John is now in the final stages of life. And he begins to give up. There was no possibility of saving me out there. I don't have any hopes whatsoever of being rescued. This little piece of boat that I'm on is going to just slide off the edge of the reef, and I am going to sink a mile down to the bottom of the ocean. But the thought of watching John die alone on the boat haunts Ben and his mum. If we don't get him off the boat, he's, he doesn't have a chance. He doesn't have a chance. I have to get him off the boat. Ben decides to head back to the boat. Oh, go to the life back. I'm gonna go to death. But the life raft is hopelessly tangled in a web of rope. Jean pulls at the life raft for over an hour. Every bit of my mind, every bit of muscle I have, I'm grunting, I'm, I'm practically drowning out there. After about 40 minutes, I was completely exhausted. I couldn't do it. Gene launches into a frenzy, a crazed frenzy, trying to push this raft out. But just as it seems, it will never be freed. The life raft just comes popping out. She just yelled at me like, I got it, I got it. We have the waves breaking on our legs and pushing us into the boat, and our legs are getting just absolutely cut up. I use all my strength to slip his upper body and slide that in. And the pain was intense. It was just a series of explosions, you know? I remember the tears that were just streamed down the side of my eyes. And my teeth, they're just grit. My son was the ray of hope, the ray of light, the steady hand.
My worries were the life raft would pop some point on the reef, like before we were able to get them to safety. Every one of those steps, there's just these explosions of pain. It's just pure agony, you know? Well, that kind of pain, it takes maybe an hour to even begin to leave you. That peak, that peak of pain. Finally, the whole family is off the boat. But it's been 10 hours since they crashed and set off their emergency beacon. And John is close to death. I knew my dad didn't have very long to live. I knew he, he wasn't going to last like till the next day. It's been 12 hours since the Silverwoods activated their emergency distress signal. But there's been no sign of rescue. Clinging to a tiny outcrop of rock, the family has all but given up hope. And inside the life raft, John is barely conscious, on the edge of death. I'm surrounded by darkness. I don't have any connection with reality. I would pray I'd ask God in return for my own suffering, in return for my own passing, would you please save the life of my wife? Save the life of my kids. Ben has done everything he can to save his dad. He can do no more. He's now resigned to his father's death. As the sun came up, I could see this little star flying on the horizon. So I thought it, was a, it could be a plane. Help! 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 I was ecstatic, like someone knew we were there. And it gets right over us, and it starts circling, just circles around and around and around. But no sooner has the plane flown over them than it disappears over the horizon. I can see the, the, the glimmer from the star kind of just diminished. Our hearts sank because we realized, you know, we're not going to get rescued. Two more hours pass, and there's no sign of the plane returning. Time was definitely running out for my dad. We need, like, a medic or a doctor here now.
I see this boat on the horizon. The family's emergency beacon had led the plane to the reef. But unable to land, the crew alerted local fishermen on a nearby island. Fifteen hours after their boat was shipwrecked, their ordeal is finally over. That was when I finally let go. I just grabbed Ben and I held him and I cried. I can't even tell you the feeling of elation. I was just relieved, like, like I just dropped a huge bag or something. We're actually going to get out of this situation. John's going to make it. The fishermen take the family to a nearby island, where they're evacuated by a medical rescue team and flown to Tahiti. After eight hours of surgery, John's life was saved. But he lost his left leg below the knee. How was it to lose a leg? I honestly can tell you, it bothered me not. When I regained consciousness, everything was new to me. Everything was spectacular to me. I'm so proud of my children. I thought Ben was a 16-year-old immature boy, and he turned into a man in an instant. Well, a lot of people use the word, like, hero and stuff like that about me. It doesn't really seem right. I just did all that stuff just because it needed to be done. I see my wife and I see my kids through an entirely different lens. And I understand exactly how magnificent that they really are. 